wondering who I am. You're saying, who's that? Who's that short guy over there? Uh, I'm from the other side of the bay, San Leandro, and I was talking to Pastor Dino this morning, and he invited me over to uh, hang out with you guys in fellowship. Uh, my name is Ruben Cortez, and uh, we're just going to take a moment here, and I, I just want to read out of Luke chapter 2 for you, and then we'll pray and ask the Lord to bless this evening. So let me see if I can find my place here. Give me a second. Well, I'll say if you have your Bible, you might want to read along, but you're not going to be able to uh, see anything. Luke chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn." Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you, you will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. And so it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem, and let, and let us see... Uh, and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. Father, we just gather together this evening, Lord, just amazed at your glory, Lord, just amazed by your love, Lord. And Lord, we know that uh, tomorrow is a special day. We, we look at December 25th, and Lord, but we truly know that you weren't born December 25th. Your word says you are from everlasting, Lord. Your word says that you were uh, the word, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Amen. And Lord, it's just a refreshing and wonderful thought to meditate upon, mm -hmm. Lord, that you are eternal, Lord. And you would come to this world, Lord, this sin-forsaken world, to come not to condemn us, Lord, mm -hmm. but to save us, Lord. Amen. And so tonight, Lord, we pray that everything that takes place here, Lord, would just bring glory to you, Lord, mm -hmm. and that your presence, Lord, would just be known here tonight. And we thank you for this building. Bless this church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, I just also want to encourage, um, I love family services. We get to worship um, with our kiddos. And so, uh, spoiler, spoiler alert, we're not singing Oh Holy, or um, we're not singing Silent Night. It was so not silent. And so that's okay if it's not tonight, you know? I just love to hear the little ones worshiping and singing and making a joyful noise. Um, and so uh, so I just wanna, you know, let the kiddos come in and feel free, let, run amok. No, feel free and hear the word. And um, yeah, let's rejoice and worship him together because how exciting, this is such an exciting night. Let's all stand. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, and reign 
some captive Israel There are more than only exile here Until the Son of God appears Rejoice, rejoice Emmanuel shall come Things mildly to us the path of knowledge show and teach us in her way to go. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel. Spring, come and cheer Thy spirits by the night and year And drive away the shades of night In death's dark shadows put to flight The stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt his When Christ was born 
good, Lord, that you'd come down to us, Lord Jesus, and save us, Lord, from our sins, God. For so long, prophets prophesied of your coming. For so long, godly men and women prayed for the Messiah to come. And you are here, Lord. You're here with us now, God. I pray that your presence will be so known, Father. Through your word, Lord, I pray that it'll pierce through our hearts, God, through all the distractions, Lord God, through every um, bit that separates us from you, God. Just let your word pierce right through, Lord Jesus, and you let your love, God, just cover any pain, Lord, that we bring in today, Lord God. Let your love cover any um, frustration or stress, God. Let all go, Lord Jesus. At your cross, we just lay it all down, Father. I pray that you be glorified in this last song in Jesus' name.
that your baby boy is Lord of all creation. Mary, did you know that your baby boy will one day rule the nation? Did you know? heaven's perfect plan this sleeping child you're holding is the Lord God, you are the great I am, Lord Jesus. And I pray that as your word is being spoken through Pastor Jason, Lord, that our ears will be open, God, and that our hearts will be ready to receive you, Lord God, that we won't walk away from this building unchanged, Father. Lord God, let us know that you are with us, Lord. Let the hearts that feel like you're so far away, God, know that you're so near and that you're not just near, but that you care and that you love them, God. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. You guys can all turn around and greet each other. Good job, you guys. Alex, is on. Um, we could. We keep them on, I think. Can we split it so it's not so good? Okay. Right, I, why don't we turn them off? Merry Christmas. How's everybody doing? How about that worship, huh? And um, as my wife said uh, before worship, I know it's a family service. I know there's kids in here uh, walking on chairs and got little flashlights on their fingers and all that. That's all good. Uh, we love that. We appreciate that. And so um, if a child walks by you, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. If your child starts crying, uh, probably take them to the back. But uh, we want to come here. We want to celebrate the King of Kings. Amen. Amen. And the Savior that was born. And uh, so I'm going to be in Luke chapter 2 as Reuben read. And I um, just want to pray again. Father, I thank you for your word, God, that you've given us. Lord, it's so clear, God. And and we thank you for this season, Lord, where, where the, the gospel is that, that the everlasting God wrapped himself in skin and came down here to us, Lord, to rescue and redeem. Lord, and there is no greater hope. Father, I pray, God, that as we go through your word, as we hear this story, God, that it wouldn't fall on deaf or hardened ears, God. It wouldn't fall on ears that have, have maybe heard it so much. God, I pray, Lord, that it would resurrect new life in us, Lord. God, I pray that it would do a good work within us, Father. I pray that your word, as it goes forth, God, that it would be filled with power, Lord. God, I pray I would be emptied of myself, Lord, and I pray, pray I would decrease and you would increase, Lord, and just let me be faithful to your word, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, Luke chapter 2. It says, in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, 
to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. So I just wanted to go through Luke tonight and just celebrate with you guys the birth of the Savior and just recount it as best I can and that we would rejoice in it. And, and um, I, we had our third kid a year ago, almost exactly December 30th. Uh, our youngest, Liam, will be one years old. And it's such a, yeah, praise the Lord, uh, such a, a wonderful reminder of just how, how fragile kids are and that the gospel comes afresh, that, that the, the great I am would come down and he would, he would come to our level to reach us and to, to redeem us. And um, this verse starts out, it says, in those days, or your version, uh, other versions say, and it came to pass. And uh, the gospel of Luke was written by uh, Luke of course, as the name implies. And Luke was a doctor. He was a physician. And so he talks about in the days of Caesar Augustus. The Bible is very accurate when it speaks, and it gives a background of, of Caesar Augustus, who was Caius Octavius. He was a grandnephew, adopted son, and primary heir to Julius Caesar. The guy ruled with an iron fist. He ruled from 31 BC to 14 AD, and he died at 76 years old. And his name was Caius Octavius, and they gave him the name Caesar Augustus, which means exalted one. So he won his battles, he conquered his foes, and he ruled the empire. And so when you do something like that, you get a name uh, such as the exalted one. And um, he instituted prosperity. He had the Pax Romana going on, which was the Roman peace, where you complied with what they wanted you to comply with, and it was cool. And if you didn't, it was not cool for you. And so he institutes a, uh, a census or a registration that everyone would return to their hometown. And it says all the world, and this is all the known world at the time, the, the world subject to Rome's rule, all the world would return in that area to where they were from, to where their lineage, where their ancestry was from. And then it brings up this guy, a, a governor, Quirinius, who was governor of Syria. And this guy, Quirinius, Josephus, in his Antiquities of the Jews, a historian, says that he was ruler of eight through, in AD 6 through 9. And there was a, a famous census he gave in AD 6, but this can't be it because Herod the Great was still alive during Jesus' birth. As we know from Matthew, Herod wanted to be king alone, and he slaughtered the, uh, all the, the kids under two years old in Bethlehem. So there's a bit of a historical problem here. Um, but if you've ever studied the Gospels, you'll know that they're, they're startlingly accurate. And sometimes it takes uh, what we know and what other things we find to catch up. So there was a guy named Sir William Ramsey who was a historian, and he wanted to, to discredit Luke at one point, And he... He, uh, he ended up finding that Luke was one of the most accurate historians of his day. And so uh, he said that Luke was start startlingly accurate in all his history and as he recounts it. So in A.D. 1764 in Tivoli, uh, a city near Rome, there was an inscription found that mentions a governor of Syria that was governor twice and had all the credentials of this guy Quirinius and was proven to be him by all historical accounts. So we see the, the accuracy of the scriptures as, as Luca, a physician, someone that's going to look into details as he recounts this. And so this census was taking place and Joseph went up from Galilee from the town of Nazareth to Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. So Joseph went to return to his ancestral home, and Mary went with them, who was with child. And um, 
So I know we got some women in here and many that have had children, and uh, God bless you. That is an amazing thing. Uh, my wife has had three, and Mary was traveling. Ladies, how would you like this? She was traveling for almost 100 miles uh, on, on donkey and walking at about nine months. So that's uh, pretty incredible. That could be the biggest miracle here. Uh, just kidding, of course, but it was, it, she, a long journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem instituted by this, this registration that was taking place, this census, and that would have been a tough trip. So, verse 5 says, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child, Verse 6, and while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. (coughs) So, notice in verse, in in the first verse, it it, it says in those days, and then in verse 6 it says, so it was during that time. And all the things that, that came together here, that we see the providence of God, that it mentions it in kind of a nonchalant way that in those days, and then it came to pass, and that they happened to go to Bethlehem. And what's happening here is, is prophecy is being fulfilled. Because in Micah 5.2, it says, But you, Bethlehem, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth are from old and from everlasting. And that was a prophecy given 8,000 years prior to this event. And Joseph doesn't seem like he was trying to go to Bethlehem, like, dude, I got to get there because Micah says I should be there because that's the prophecy and the angels came and and they revealed themselves to me and Mary and and she's with the Savior of the world born, uh, going to be born of the Holy Spirit. What's going on here? And, And he doesn't try and manufacture all that and make it happen. What we see here is the providence of God being uh, fulfilled, that God calls a pagan ruler like Augustus to to create a a census and and Quirinius as governor to institute it and all these things. And you had masses of people moving around on slow-moving animals. Now we got uh, cars and everything. You can imagine all these people trying to get to their town. And the providence of God is, is being carried out here that Joseph, who happened to be of the lineage of David, of previously through that, Abraham, from which the promise originally came, and we have this whole thing being staged and put together through the providence of God, and Luke mentions it as though it could be something somewhat in passing. He, you know, he, so it came to pass, and it just so happened that when they were in Bethlehem, that she gave birth, and God seems so, so casual about the thing, but this is significant. This is the most significant thing that has happened, and Jesus fulfilling this prophecy and also fulfilling 330 other prophecies throughout his life. Um, there was a book written years ago called Science Speaks by Dr. Peter Stoner. Really good book, and he points out the probability, the statistical probability of somebody fulfilling just eight of the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. He fulfilled over 330, so they take, oh, let's just take just eight and see how hard that would be statistically. Let me try and give you a word picture. So in his book, he says, um, you take the, the state of Texas. Anyone ever been to Texas? Big, right? Everything's bigger in Texas, right? It's a, it's a big uh, place, so... Texas is big, so he says you take the whole state of Texas, you fill it three feet deep with silver dollars, you pre-mark one of the silver dollars red, and you hide it somewhere in the state of Texas. It could be anywhere. It could be in Galveston or Austin or one of the big long stretches of highway uh, running through there. You could hide the silver dollar anywhere, just one silver dollar in a stack three feet deep, filling the whole state of Texas. And he says if you, you blindfold someone, you parachute them in there, you drop them in Texas, and if they, they go around and they, they reach in randomly, they pull out one of those silver dollar coins, and it's the one that's marked red, that's the probability statistically of somebody fulfilling just eight of the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled 
and he fulfilled over 330. Yeah, there we go. So it's accurate. The Bible is startlingly accurate, especially Luke's account, how clear it is. And I love how in this, as I was studying this, this portion, it says, in those days. And, and, and so it came to pass. But yet God had extreme significance in this. This wasn't just a passing thing or something just to, to, to shake your hand at. It was, it was the Savior of the world coming to this world to redeem and to restore and to break the, the curse of sin and death. And so you may be in a, a part of your life where you think it's insignificant. Even coming here to hear and to celebrate Christmas on this Christmas Eve service, it may be just seeming, seemingly insignificant to you. But I would say that's how God rolls sometimes, where, where he wraps great significance, and he just mentions it in passing, because he can. And he will work all things to good, and he's in control. See, when you're in control, you can do that. You don't got to hype things. Okay, our culture likes to hype things and get things all hyped up, and usually the hype outweighs the actual thing. You know, it's like the thing that was being hyped. When it comes, people are like, ah, man, I thought it was going to be better than that because of all the hype. See, God doesn't do that. He doesn't need to. He underhypes and he overdelivers. He underhypes and he overdelivers. And so for whatever reason you're here, you may just think it was, and so I happen to be at Calvary San Mateo hearing the gospel message, hearing that Christ came to redeem and restore and have relationship with us and lead us and guide us and, and remove the, the sting of death because he's removed the curse of sin and, and all of us stand guilty as sinners before him. And he came to restore us all. And I believe that God has extreme significance for us all tonight. And hearing about Christ and hearing of this story again, this may be the filler time for you in between shopping and, and food and friends and lattes and all traffic and all the other things. But I would say God has packed in significance for this to get us to remember Christ, to remember the birth, to remember why he came and to rejoice in that above all of the things during this season and all the busyness and all the craziness that this season brings. So don't open those gifts under the tree without passing the gift and cherishing and praising the gift that was given, who grew up to be nailed to a tree. And don't enjoy the presence under it and miss his presence this season. That he, that's why he came. As Christina prayed, he came down to us to rescue us and to receive us and to redeem us. The Old Testament says that his name will be Emmanuel, and Emmanuel means God with us. And Christianity is, is the only religion where the arm is extended down from the divine to reach us where we are at, to meet us where we are at, that we might grab on, that we might be lifted up, that we might be encouraged and restored and given purpose not only in this life, but in the next. So 6 says, and while they were there, the time came. So it just seems in passing, right? I mean, that's something you say when someone's going to the store, and you're like, hey, while you're there, can you also get chocolate chip cookies? You know what I mean? It's like you just throw it in there. But God builds in extreme significance with this. Verse 7, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. There was no room for him in the inn, as I'm sure we all know. There's a small home in Atlanta on Auburn Avenue that gets tours every day because somebody named Martin Luther King Jr. was born there. There's in Salzburg, Austria, you can go and check out a birth room that's on display where Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart was born. In Knob Creek, Kentucky, there's a humble log cabin where Abraham Lincoln was born. And tours go there, and you can go check it out. On the island of Corsica, there's a residence that now stands as a museum. 
where Napoleon, Napoleon Bonaparte gave his first cries after he was born. And wow, how this innkeeper missed out. Can you imagine the plaque he could have put on the wall of his inn? Years later, Jesus Christ was born here. But he missed out. And there was no room for him in the inn, as we know. There was no room for Christ. And so he was born in a manger, in a, in a feeding trough, in a cave around animals. The king stooped down to this level. He didn't come from heaven to earth and say, you know, I'm going to be born in uh, Kaiser Permanente in 2000, you know, or say Mills is probably better. Or, you know, uh, I'm going to be born in just the Stanford, you know, I want, I want the best doctors on hand. I don't want them to mess this up, right? You know, I want, I'm, I'm the king here. I'm, I'm, I want things to go well. Well, he was born in a manger because who can't relate to that? There isn't a a person alive on the planet that that couldn't relate to that. Where God could say, hey, that's that's where I stoop down. I stoop down to reach the lowest of the low and the highest of the high and whoever may come. But there was no room and how this foreshadowed Christ through the ages, there being no room for him. Though he split time, we got B.C. and A.D., and Christ is the life that split time. Though the remains, he remains the most iconic, compelling, and influential figure of all time. And this was confirmed again by a little thing called the Internet. Maybe you've heard of it. But they did an algorithm looking at searches, looking at all the traffic of the Internet, and who is the most influential, compelling, iconic figure of human history. And it was Jesus by a landslide, still. And though he is that, there is often no room for him. I was in a Home Depot a while ago, and uh, I was just looking around, you know, at some Christmas lights and stuff. And, and then you got everything in there. You got anything and everything. You got either a Santa, you know, you got the Grinch, you got SpongeBob with his Santa hat on. You got uh, just all kinds of inflatable things and reindeers and Shreks and all these things, you know. And I was just like, man, I want to get a manger scene is what I kind of wanted for my yard, but you ain't going to find that. You ain't going to find that there. And I wonder how much space we give him. And I think obviously if you're here, you've given him room. You've made some room for, for Christ. You've made some room for a, a service that, you know, would, would honor and, and talk about Jesus. But I would ask, how much space are you giving him, considering we know who he is and we know what he's done? And I would encourage you to, to invite him in to your life, that he would be the Lord of your life. He is the Savior of the world. We all stand in this predicament where time is passing and our bodies are fading and everything is fading out and everything is winding down and Christ alone stands as the hope of the world and we want I want to be able to look at people I know and 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 encourage them in Christ and know that when they breathe their last here that I don't got to think maybe they're just in a better place and 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 wonder about <laughs> the longest vacation you're ever going to take. And we plan just so much for maybe a two-week vacation. We, we dial it in. We want things, you know, we want to know where we're going, what jet we're going on. Hopefully it's not U.S. Airways. You know, we had a bad experience with them. Uh, I'm sorry if you work for them. Uh, maybe they've done well. Um, but, you know, we want to know all things are in line. We want Expedia to have it printed out and, and hooked up, and we want a rental car. But yet with eternity, we just kind of say, ah, But that's why he came, is it not? The Savior of the world to rescue us and to redeem us. And there's a poem about this Jesus that was written a long time ago. It says, he was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant. He grew up in another village where he worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. Then for three years, he was an itinerant preacher. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never had a family or owned a home. He didn't go to college. He never lived in a big city. He never traveled 200 miles from the place he was born. He did none of the things that usually accompany greatness. 
He had no credentials but himself. He was only 33 when the tide of public opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. One of them denied him. He was turned over to his enemies and went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. While he was dying, his executioners gambled for his garments, the only property he had on earth. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Twenty centuries have come and gone. And today he is a central figure of the human race. I am well within my mark when I say that all the armies that ever marched and all the navies that ever sailed and all the parliaments that ever sat, all the kings that ever reigned put together have not affected the life of man on this earth as much as that one solitary life. The life of Christ, the the one we worship, the one we gather here to honor and to proclaim and to rejoice in and sing about and worship. He is the one. And verse 8 says, And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling claws and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem. And seeing this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So this is an interesting part that the, these angels appeared to shepherds. So let's see, God plans the, the birth of his son, who would be savior of the world, at a time when it's just crazy. People are moving all around, and he orchestrates the whole thing that, yes, prophecy would be fulfilled. He would be born in Bethlehem, because that's what the prophecy said in Micah 5 too. But then... Uh, he's, he's born in a, in a manger. There's going to be no room for him in the inn. He's going to be born in a feeding trough where all these stinky animals around him, all that's going to be going on. Then, then let's see who we're going to announce this to. We're going to announce this to shepherds who were like on the lower rung of the, the social scene at the time and as far as their occupation. They didn't have much influence. They're just out there kind of standing in the field watching their, their sheep in the night. You know, making jokes, whatever, uh, passing gas. Who knows what they were doing, what shepherds do at night when they're watching their animals. But that's what they were doing. And, and then the, the angels decide to appear to them, to just normal folk, to see shepherds out in the field. And I love this picture that there's suddenly an angel, there's just like a, a multitude of angels in the sky praising God and giving him glory because it's where it's due And then they say, hey, this is going to be the sign to you. You're going to find a baby. You're going to find Jesus. And that's going to be the sign. See, you would think like, uh, I don't know, maybe the angels all up in the sky would be the sign. You know, and that's the sign most people I think want. They're like, all right, if God would reveal himself and break the clouds open and I could see his face and he would say, hey, how you doing? I'm God. And, and you know, and if he would like reveal himself in that way, that would be cool. And then, then I might believe that. But he's saying, no, the sign is going to be not these angels praising God. I mean, God is getting praise all the time. But the sign is going to be, you're going to go to this town, and you're going to see the baby. And, and they, the angels point to Christ. And I would say for us, that's the sign as well. That we, it's not some about some sign in the sky. We want to see just angels appearing here and singing, and then we'll be like, oh man, that was crazy, see that? No, the sign that we're all pointed to is Christ, is his life. John 1 gives us a glimpse of his birth that, that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And, and John 1.14 says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, that the great I am, the Alpha and the Omega the God, the everlasting one, the creator of the, the universe, 
who spoke all things into existence would be born and would become a man. And that will be the sign. And that's the sign I would, I would want to give you tonight and encourage you to seek Christ, to seek Jesus. Psalm 34, 8 says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. And, God, and Christ has not continued to change human history because there's no power there or because His Holy Spirit isn't working within the hearts of people who would come to Him by faith. And seek the hope of the cross and the forgiveness that is there. It is no accident. That's the sign. Christ is the sign. Seek Him. Pursue Him. He is good. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Hebrews 11 says, He's a rewarder. And so they go, let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary. I like how it always, in almost every translation, uses the word haste. Very nice. And they went with haste, which is they went quickly. I know we don't use that word, but we should bring it back. They went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the same that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. So they hear the angels declare, hey, go and find Jesus. That's the sign. Don't worry about all these Thousands of angels that just appeared in the sky to sing to you. Don't worry about it. That's no big deal. You know what? Go and find Jesus. He is the one that we've been waiting for. He is the one the world has been waiting for. I believe there's a hope wound up within us that only Christ can fulfill. God says in Ecclesiastes 3.11 that he set eternity in our hearts. That we would continually just, we, we know this is so temporary. And what's next? And what's the ultimate fulfillment of all these things that our hearts long for and hope for and the love and the hope and the peace and the joy and all these things? And they're founded in Christ. And they're only found in Him. And that's what the gospel message is about. That these, and the, so these shepherds, they went and they found that baby. And they were changed. And they were praising God because of them. That baby, I don't who knows why or what, what struck and what happened? And who knows why as Christians that we walk with the Lord. And I, I don't know why years ago, man, when I gave my life to the Lord, it was like, man, God did some change. He, he did some change on the inside of my heart. He put new desires there. He put me on a, took me off a path I was going on and put me on a right one and, and continues to teach and instill things every day in my life. Man, that we would go and seek Jesus. He is the hope the world is waiting for. He's the hope of the world. This world's like the Titanic. It's going down. And we're so busy rearranging the deck chairs. Like, oh, we want the things to look nice and, you know, keep it looking nice for as long as we can. Oh, here comes the water, but I don't want to think about that. Don't you make me think about that water rising. Hey, we abandoned ship. And we trust in Christ. He is the life raft. And we, we get that message out to as many as, as will listen. And, and this is the, the season where it's like, man, we could, and I just pray that we would step back from all the craziness and clutter right now in our hearts and, and wherever we're at. Because I believe that God has significance in this moment. Though it may seem like something in passing to you, though it may seem like a filler thing for you to be here on Christmas Eve, kind of a new thing for us to do, Christmas Eve services, though it might feel that way, that, that God through his Holy Spirit right now would reveal himself to you, that you're here for a purpose. Everybody, I don't know whether, how, why you came, what, what invite, Facebook, friends, family, whatever, personal invite, whatever it is, that you're created in God's image, that he loves you, that he has hope for you, that he sent his son for you. 
I mean, the gospel, there's, there's no level that the gospel doesn't connect. You know, I have three, three boys now, and I, I, I try and fathom it sometimes. Like, man, well, who would I give my, I, would give, why am I, I wouldn't give my son for anyone. Who would think of that? What is that? And to think that the gospel is the, the creator of all things. God Almighty would give his son for us. And that he would give us hope, a hope that is real, a hope that is everlasting, a hope that we could rest on through the thick and the thin, through the easy and the hard times. So being a Christian don't make you exempt from the hard times, but you have joy in the midst of it. Because Christ changes not. And he is where it's found. And that we would marvel at the, the, the baby who was born, who would become the son that was slain who would be the king that is conquered. That we would rejoice like these shepherds, knowing that, hey, we're probably not much. We're just regular folk. Yeah, wonderfully made and created in his image, for sure. And there's brilliance to us. We're woven together, and our brains and our skulls are the most fantastic things scientists have ever discovered in this universe. It's just amazing. We each got one. It's pretty cool. You know, it would probably cost a lot if you had to buy it, but you don't. You have it. It's amazing. And we're we're, we're made fearfully and wonderfully in this God. He came to redeem us and that we would rejoice in Christ, our Savior, that we would echo what the shepherds echoed here and were called to echo, that in the city of David back then, that, that a Savior was born. As Isaiah says, a son was given. For us, but not to keep for us, that we would echo that message with our lives and with whatever we say and whatever we do. And that would compare, we could compare it with whatever else is going in, on in our lives, whatever other things are grabbing our attention, not only for Christmas time, but all the time. He's the King of Kings. We should give Him due time all the time, we should give Him space all the time. We should let him rule and reign and work in our lives and our hearts all the time. Because he came down to rescue. There was a historian and a philosopher, Soren Kierkegaard. And he had a story. He said, once there was a king, very wealthy and world-renowned. He had everything a person could want except a wife. The palace was so empty, and he wanted a wife to share it all with. Well, one day, while riding through the country, he saw a peasant girl on the side of the road and was stunned by her beauty. His heart was taken by her. If only I could have the peasant girl. How could I win her heart? Well, I am king. I could send out a royal decree and make her come and and be my wife. Well, what's the use? Unless there's, it's her free choice, it real, really wouldn't be love. I could dress up in my finest apparel, polished boots, polished sword, dazzling cape. I could awe her as I knock at her door and she will become my wife. No. Then she will marry me for my power and money and I'll never know if she really loved me. No, I know what I could do. I'll dress up like a peasant and I'll have... The carriage dropped me off a few miles from her house, and I'll come in as a peasant and woo her with my charm and win her that way. Then he thought, well, that'll be hypocrisy. Well, what if I actually became a peasant? So that's what he did. He took off his robe. He left his palace. He worked hard. He served alongside peasants and won her heart. Is that not what Christ has done? From heaven to earth, as he would step down, I mean, even to talk about such things is is crazy. That he would step down for us, that he would take off all as the everlasting one, all so many forms of deity and omnipresence, he would, he would lay those aside as the Bible says. He put those attributes on the shelf. And he would step down here. 
into the mess that you find here. As we all know, our lives can get very messy. You watch the news, you, you, you look at this world, you think, this place is messed up. And that's what the Bible would say it is. It's broken. All of us are broken. We're all broken. And Christ would step down into that brokenness to win our heart. He would step down. He would, he would win the day. He would die for our sin on the cross. All of our sin, past, present, and future, which separates us from a holy God. And that he would do that, rise again, conquering death and the grave, and give us then that hope. That hope that comes with that. For what he's done for us, for whatever your story is right now, whatever you're going through, wherever you're at, it could be lost someone recently or know someone that's not doing well, issues going on in your life, whatever it may be, maybe it's with you, maybe it's something going on in your body, so many different things, and you got to know that Christ came for that, he came to redeem that came to redeem you, restore our relationship with you, that he could give you a hope that's everlasting, a hope that is eternal, a hope that doesn't perish, and a hope that doesn't fade. Now we would rejoice in that, that we could go out echoing what these angels have been echoing, what the shepherds were echoing, and what I believe the world is longing to hear is, is that there's a Savior that's been born. And then as they look at our lives, that it would echo the same thing. And we would live as, he, as Christ lived. We would be conformed to his image. And we wouldn't leave here the same. So I want to invite the worship team back up for a couple more songs. And just want to give us just a few moments to, to seek out the Lord. As the angels proclaim to the shepherds, hey, you know what the sign's going to be? It's going to be Jesus. It's going to be Christ. The Savior of the world. The Messiah. The promised one throughout the ages. What, you're, what your heart is longing for, it's going to be Him. The Word became flesh and, and dwelt among us. We know He was crucified, risen again. And Jesus was ascended. He said, it's better that I go because I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And He will lead you into all truth. And He will guide you. And during these, these moments, these last song or two, that, that you would just take some time to sit before the Lord. Maybe it's just to thank him, to rejoice in who he is and that he's rescued your life, that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Maybe it's to repent of some sin that's crept in your life because we're all prone to wander and that maybe you need to repent of some things that have crept in and, and the Lord's working, he's pulling on your heart right now, the Holy Spirit's tugging on your heart saying, come back you come back my son my daughter maybe you've you've never given your life to Christ you've never received Christ as your Lord and Savior this would be a good moment to turn from your sin to trust him to bow the knee to realize I don't got it all under control. God has convicted me of sin, of righteousness, of a, of a coming judgment because of sin. And that Christ was given as the only escape. Because God doesn't want to judge. He will because he's holy and he's just. 
He is just. But don't you see he's done all that he can? He's done everything he can. I remember thinking about my mom a long time ago, and Lord, what if she doesn't know you? What? She's such a nice person, and just wrestling with that. God, what could I, what could I say? What could I do? I went up on a mountain, and I took some time. I remember just so fresh, the Lord, in his wisdom, I said, what, what else can I do? What have I not done? I've given everything. I've given everything for her. And I stand with my arms wide open. I'm not hard to find. And I'll give you that encouragement to seek Jesus. To seek him. And as the Psalms say, the taste and see that the Lord is good. Don't miss out like the innkeeper did. Don't miss out. Don't have no room. Don't be so busy. Every moment of every day and just got things going on. Give him space. Take this time right now to seek him. To do some inventory right now with him. He's longing for it. Lord, I thank you for, for your word. God, I thank you for your Holy Spirit, Father. Lord, that you are a father. Lord, that you are the hope for the hopeless. God, that you are the savior of the world. Lord, you are the light to all men. You are the king of kings who stooped down to become a servant serve and wash our feet. God, I pray that you would you would do that now, Lord. God, as we put trust in you and faith, Lord, that you would do what you've been doing. All the armies that have ever marched and all the, the navies that have ever sailed and all the parliaments that have ever sat and all the kings that have ever reigned. Do not have the power that you have, Christ. That we would serve you out of sheer love for you. God, that you would move within our soul. God, that you would draw us to yourself. Lord, if there's anyone that, that doesn't know you in here, Father, I pray that they would put their trust in you. In the finished work of the cross or it is finished Lord, that you would give us a real hope God that you would fill us with joy and that we would leave as the shepherds left so they saw you God that they would that we would leave rejoicing praising God full of joy and it wouldn't be because of those presents tomorrow those are cool we're looking forward to those, especially the kids. That is great. Lord, but we wouldn't miss you in this season. And God, I pray that not only would we not miss you, but we would make you everything. In Jesus' name. I'll wait for tomorrow. You can have him today. You can have a change, he can change. While well, wait for tomorrow. When you can have him today, he can change, he can change. Every longing rests his heart Come now long expect to Jesus Born to say
thy people to deliver born or child and yet a king born to reign in us forever now thy gracious kingdom bring for Israel's strength and consolation over all the earth this last song. Sing joy to the world. true joy that's only found in you, Jesus. In your name, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a Merry Christmas.